actually hot outside for once. It's kind of nice. And welcome to the people here. And uh, oh, I see the Caldwells in the back. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're also welcoming uh, Robin Seifert, our uh, uh, over from Bangladesh with Basha, and her parents are here. She's going to give the message today, and I'm excited to hear what she has to share. Um, and welcome to those on Zoom. I hope that uh, you're having a good day too. And now Joyce will start us with the prayer.
Here is the call to confession. The promise of Pentecost lies in the relentless, irresistible activity of God, whose spirit comes among us with power and grace. God refuses to leave us alone, but rather keeps showing up with mercy and love. In confidence, let us confess our sins. And please join me in the prayer. Spirit of love, you know the yearning for love that rests in each and every one of us. Help us love one another, even when hatred and anger well within us. Bring us peace and patience, even when restless and enmity fill our hearts. Inspire us to live with generosity of spirit, when we are in attitudes to self centered thoughts and selfish actions. Shower us with joy and hope when fear and despair are all around. Bear your food in our lives through the power of your grace and forgiveness, that we may be children of your spirit, living by your power and following where you lead. In gratitude and trust we pray. Amen. Hear these words from Jesus. Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. In the midst of our fears and doubts, the peace of the Holy Spirit will prevail. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, when Jesus left his disciples, he did not leave them alone. He promised that the Holy Spirit would be present in their lives, and he gave them an amazing gift, his peace, the peace of Christ. Through the Spirit, this gift lives still, and it is ours to share with others. Turn to those around you and offer Christ's gift in these words. The peace of Christ is with you today. Stand. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here again. I was here a year ago around the same time, so it's um, great to be back. Um, hope you can hear me okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, go back to the scripture that Mark read two weeks ago. It's the story of Ananias, and I'm going to read it from the New Revised Standard Version. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at that house of Judah look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. 
At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a, vis in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard about this man from many, and how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and how here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And I'll reiterate the challenge that Mark gave us two weeks ago. Open our eyes to the reality of God and God's kingdom. Know that you are in a long line of believers who have trusted in the good news. Put your trust in Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Don't just believe talking the talk, but walk in the way of Jesus. The cost is your very life. God opened my eyes to the work that he was doing in Bangladesh in 2006 when I was doing HIV awareness with an NGO, a non-governmental organization. And I realized how people were really thirsty for information and thirsty to, to have engagement and relationship and information and opportunities. So we started a training program for women who had been in street-based prostitution and they really were desperate for another opportunity. They wanted to escape the shame that society had put on them and they were so eager to have dignified work and to do something they were proud of and to raise their children in a way that they were proud of. They wanted their children to have the safety and the opportunity that they themselves never had. In 2010, my four years with the NGO was coming to an end and I was trying to decide what to do. I had in my mind that I really wanted to do, to do public health. I have a master's in public health and that was kind of the goal of my career was to get a well-paid public health job overseas and um, that, was, that was the plan. Um, and I had some friends visit me and I took them to the train station in the town where I was living. And the train was actually late and so we were waiting around. It was a bit, it was dark, it was um, quite late by the time the train came. And, and this woman kept coming up to us and she, she said, I want to cut your throat. And the children with us of course were terrified. Um, the adults we knew that she was just severely mentally ill and she didn't pose any actual threat. One of the women who I'd been working with, who was one of the first participants of our training program, her name's Regia, and Regia turned to us and she said, this is what happens to everybody in prostitution. They lose their minds. This is what happens. This is what happens. So the train eventually left my friends, I saw my friends off, and Regia continued to walk me along the train station. By this time I think it was like 9 p.m. And there were two girls around the age of 11 or 12, um, and the age my nieces are now, <laughs> and, and one of them um, didn't have a father and one of them didn't have a mother. The, the train platform is just just, you know, it's where the trains come and go, but that's where people sleep um, as a makeshift place when they don't have anywhere else. Um, because these two girls, one didn't have a mother, one didn't have a father, they were both, their, their parents couldn't protect them all the time, or the way they needed protection in this vulnerable place on the, on the train platform. So Regia turned to me and she said, they'll be prostituted soon. Across the way there was a, a baby also spending, spending the night there on the platform and that baby was only four days old and already starting out his little life homeless and vulnerable. 
The next afternoon I happened to have another friend visit. It was unusual to have so many visitors, but I took the, I took her to the train station as well. And I was visiting the, the mother of one of the girls who had been in our, our training program. This mother had been in prostitution much of her life and she lived in like this makeshift tent by the railway tracks and her daughter had been forced into prostitution basically because of the stigma of her mother. Because her mother was in prostitution, there was little else that she could do with dignity. And there were children playing around. Um, like this is right by the rail tracks. So, you know, it's not a place to live. It's squalor. It just felt like hopelessness. And then out of the corner of my eye, I catch this movement and this light. And, and some of the women from our training program walk, were walking down the railway tracks and they hold up their books and they said, sister, sister, we're going home to practice our reading. These were girls who had, who had so little chance for education, so little chance for dignity. They've had horrible things happen to them. And yet they have so much hope and pride in the new opportunities of dignity. And at that moment, I knew I'm not leaving Bangladesh. <laughs> I'm not going to that, um, I'm not getting that public health career I'd planned on. <laughs> um, God opened my eyes to the need, but he also opened my eyes to a solution. I, um, in 2011, I returned to Bangladesh, which is about a year later, and I started a social enterprise to employ women at risk and survivors of, of trafficking. I wasn't scared like Ananias was of my safety, but I was scared of the, just how, what a big responsibility this was, how far it was from anything I'd ever done before, and how unequipped I felt for this task. <laughs> Our social enterprise, Basha Boutique, it started very small with just a few women. Um, and we also started a nonprofit called Friends of Basha. So the company provides employment for women who are vulnerable in a safe place, a supportive environment. And, and then the nonprofit provides the additional services they need. So um, at the moment, we have around 115 women, 115, not 100, 115, who've been at risk at trafficking and are healing from trafficking. And they're working either in production or support work. A couple have gone on to be managers. Um, and we have around 135 children in our daycares who are who are in a safe place going to school having education having support while their moms are working and then we have about 45 additional staff who are managing the daycare, managing production, exporting the products, um, overseeing, developing new products, and engaging with customers, things like that. We also have a children's home. We have about 14 girls in the children's home in ranging, ranging from eight years old to 18. And two of these girls are sisters. One of them came along about 10 years ago when she was about eight. She went to our partner organization and she was hungry. She was being, her mom was homeless, so she was living on the streets. She was sent out to beg, which was not safe. Many girls were molested doing this. And she was hungry. So the, the, our partner organization invited her, her in along with some other girls and they provided safety. They got them enrolled in school. They gave them their, their three meals a day. And she really thrived there. But, um, she still had a lot of trauma from her years on the street. Her mom was happy with the arrangement until she decided she needed her to help with her little sister. So she, took, she came and she got her and she took her out of the safe house and she took her back on the streets. And I don't know why she felt like she couldn't come back on her own, but eventually the staff saw her just standing outside looking longingly. She was skinny, she was hungry, and so they invited her back in and she's been there ever since. She's now 18 years old and she is working on her exam. She's studying for her exams and she is hoping to go to nursing school. Her little sister came to us a couple years ago and when her sister came to our, to our children's home, she said it was the first time she'd ever slept in a bed. There's, another, there's other children that we support in boarding school. The reason for this is lots of the children don't have parents who are safe. Um, one example is three little brothers. Well, they range from 14 to six. And they, um, 
they, their mom has been with us almost from the beginning and she has so many mental health issues. She herself grew up on the street. She didn't have a loving home. She didn't have, she didn't have any family. So she ended up in prostitution from a young age, drug use, and now she just has severe mental illness and it makes her, sometimes she's very warm, very effusive. If you met her, you would just she'd hug you and 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 she'd embrace you but she can always be also be volatile and erratic so we've been able to put her three boys in boarding school so that they can have a good education and have a consistent home life we can see how proud she is though when they come to visit during this during their holidays they come visit and she's so proud of their education and she's so proud of all the opportunities that they have that she never had um, in one area, we have a transition home for women who aren't able to live back with their families and still need ongoing support. It's very, it's very difficult in Bangladesh for women to live alone, so this way they have each other, they have a community, they have a, a mother, mother figure um, running the home, so she helps them as well. And I've seen God so faithfully guiding us, providing for us, in so many ways, through sales, through, ev through everything. But sometimes I still have that panic and that fear when it just seems so overwhelming. Not sometimes, a lot of time, <laughs> like yesterday. <laughs> um, there's so much involved in running a social enterprise. We depend on sales to make money. That's how we stay alive is through sales, through business and we employ vulnerable women who have a lot of challenges and are difficult to employ and we provide the daycare and support for their children that's a that's a big expense and a big tool on a business and then we also rely on donations to cover the social programs the training program um, and and even our staff, like our staff also require a lot of development. This year we focused a lot on their spiritual development um, and we focused on their training. We've done some parenting training. All our staff have gone through a parenting tra training, which is the, basically how to nurture and encourage children. And we also uh, train, do a lot of training in professional skills. So there's a lot of, a lot of different roles. I wear a lot of different hats and, and it can often seem overwhelming. We want to make sure that every single person at Basha knows that they are made in the image of God and precious in His sight and worthy of His safe, pure and sacrificial love. When these things do seem so overwhelming, like I said yesterday, <laughs> and even today as I talk about them, I, re I remember I'm only called to step into what God is already doing. Just like Ananias, he didn't have to, to, to do anything except commission Paul, send him. God had, God had Paul's destiny. God had Paul's God, God had it in control, but he used Ananias in that. And what a special thing to be able to step into what God is doing and be part of it. Ananias obeyed God, and he went to Saul, and he knew the risks, and he knew the danger. He'd just seen Stephen being stoned to death. He knew, he knew the danger. Being in God's will does not mean you're safe. Being in God's will does not, Stephen was in God's will. Stephen was following God and he was not safe. And so Ananias knew this as he, as he, went, to, as he went to Saul. God telling you to do it doesn't mean you're going to leave a life. <laughs> and he knows that. Um, uh, to C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe gives us a, a really nice picture of this in a conversation between Mr. Beaver and Susan. Aslan is a lion. The lion, the great lion, said Mr. Beaver. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Corsi isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Bangladesh is a country that is 89% Muslim. In its 50-year history, there have been several outbreaks of, of terrorism, one way or the other. While I've been there, uh, I saw Islamic attacks escalate between 2013 and 2016. Secular or atheist writers, bloggers, and publishers were hacked to death. Homosexuals were targeted. And religious minorities, including Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, and Shia Muslims, were attacked and killed. 
An Italian aid worker was ambushed by three men on motorcycle and shot to death right in the city center. A Catholic priest who was also a doctor serving the poor in rural Bangladesh was shot at close range as he rode his bike to the hospital where he worked. The bullets grazed his head, but he survived. Hit lists circulated of people the terrorists were watching. I'll never forget one Easter Sunday. Every, every Easter, we all the Christians in Dhaka of every denomination come together for a sunrise service. And it's just a, a lovely day of all of us coming together to celebrate Easter. And one, this, one year, this one year in 2016, up in front in this, this big intersection, we're all sitting there, thousands of people. And up in front, all the pastors had actually received a letter saying, enjoy your last meal before we execute you. And they're sitting there worshiping God. It was, it was powerful. This all culminated in an attack on a popular cafe in Dhaka where 20 people, mostly foreigners, were tortured and murdered through the night on 2nd of July in 2016. Bangladesh was in collective shock. The hospitable Bangladeshis were just as devastated as the terrified foreigners. Foreigners, like me, left the country in droves, and the U.S. Embassy sent all the families home, so only single people were allowed to stay, or adults were allowed to stay. They kept minimum staff, and people were only allowed to travel by cars, or if they left the diplomatic zone, they actually traveled in armored vehicles. And most organizations had policies that you only traveled by car. But I didn't have a car, and I didn't have a budget for one. And I searched my heart and felt that quiet assurance, like this is still the right place for me. This attack doesn't change that. I still walk to work, I still walk to the shops, and sometimes motorcycles would come up behind me and I'd be jumpy and, and a little scared. Sometimes I'd walk like this. I walk through the garden and there's guys with machetes. They're walking around carrying machetes to cut the weeds, but I'd be like, oh, what are you doing with that? Um, so I had some fear, but I also just felt this peace and reassurance at the same time. And it was felt so powerful again to be moving through all this tension and all this fear and all this terror with the peace and presence of God. I mentioned earlier the challenge of running a social enterprise, trying to be a business with limited resources and overwhelming need. Last year I knew I couldn't sustain every, any, everything much longer, so I set up a leadership team of four and I continued to work closely with them, training them, consulting with them, um, we're making decisions together and it's been amazing to see how together we can do so much more than than one person like I've been able to to really rely on them and I've seen how how my decisions too have really improved by getting their feedback and all of us working together and it excites me to see like what what how God will lead us in the future as Basha expands beyond just my vision for it, but what their vision is. And, and yeah, I just feel like we can step into more of what God has for us in the coming, in the coming years. Ananias was willing to face his fear and follow God's guidance to commission the man who had come with murderous intentions for him. It's so exciting to see the kingdom of God grow beyond yourself. It's been a delight seeing our team connect with God, find healing and wholeness, and being led by Him, encountering love, and sharing it with the vulnerable women and children that God has brought to us. The stories of the women we work with really vary, but there's a lot of commonality. Basically, many of them just find themselves in a vulnerable position, and someone takes advantage of that and exploits them or sells them or, or uses them. One example was a woman who was invited to India actually by her sister-in-law. Her brother's wife invited her to, to come do this job sewing, embroidering saris in India. And her sister-in-law was actually working with another woman to traffic her. So she found herself in a, in a brothel in Bangalore. Another woman went to Saudi Arabia to work as a maid, and once she was in the home, then they took her passport and they fed her, her very little, and they <clears throat> beat and tortured her. 
and gave and told her she was their property. She was able to return to Bangladesh and both of these women were able to complete our training and rehabilitation program and begin working at Bacha. Basically, um, because Bangladesh is a conservative Muslim country, these women are labeled bad. The word they say is karap mohila, like bad woman, and this label sticks. So, um, one woman uh, was trafficked to India as a teenager, and she was rescued, but she was kept in an Indian home where she did not receive the social supports that she actually needed to heal. So finally she escaped to Bangladesh after about five years and she was referred to our training program and she, she completed that but she, she could hardly speak. She was so traumatized. She had forgotten Bangla, she spoke Hindi, she had to relearn her native language and she didn't know how to read or write. She had to learn like from the very beginning how to read and write. But eventually she was smiling and happy and settled in the community. She began working, earning, saving money. But she'd cry sometimes, saying how much she missed her family. Our staff tried to be a family to her, celebrating birthdays and, and really caring for her as much as they could, even though she could be um, difficult to manage sometime. But her, and they contacted her family. They said she really wants to come visit you. And they just thought of the stigma and they said, no, we don't want her to come. And this went on for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. And finally they said, okay, her father's sick so she can come for one week for the holiday. So the staff took her and she stayed and in fact, she's still there um, about a year later, and I, she even just got married. And we, I just found this out this week, like she just got married as well, and she's really happy. And I don't know what changed her family's heart to first see just the shame that was still on her from being trafficked, and, and when she went back, that they were able to forget that and embrace her and, and care for her. and and provide a marriage for her. But I have a theory. As someone receives love and care, they can let go of their own shame. They can see the love and dignity that she has embraced and that she carries in her. And so then they're able to embrace her as well. That's just one story. We have a lot of stories like that where women who were rejected and just in shame and, and um, bad reputation are welcomed back into their families and back into their communities. We have a, a new training program going on. We've expanded our program recently. And one woman in the program was, her husband started cheating on her the first week they were married. And he, his, his brother actually beat her up and tried to traffic her and the community rescued her. So, so right now she's in our training program, she's learning to, to read and write, she's learning life skills, values, professionalism, she's learning to make our Basha products, which you can see in the back after the service. And through donations we're able to pay her a stipend for the duration of her training so she doesn't have to worry about how she's going to survive and she can focus on learning and healing. When she graduates she'll be able to work at Basha and support herself. If she has children, they'll be in our daycare on the same premises. She's so grateful for this opportunity and she's seeing her life change. She has newfound respect from relatives and she enjoys the community. She's improving in reading and writing and her painful memories are fading. All around us are people who don't have eyes that see the kingdom. Women who have been abandoned, trafficked and exploited often feel there's no hope for them and they need the scales to fall from their eyes so that they can see that they are made in the image of God and deeply loved by Jesus. Our leaders and employees at Basha need to know that they are image bearers, deeply loved by Jesus, and they need to experience his love so deeply that they can share it with the women and children we serve. Here in Waldport are people all around you who desperately need the love of Jesus. Neighbors, friends, relatives, community, people in service industry, people who's re who are receiving the food boxes you distribute. They need the scales to fall from their eyes that they would know that they are made in the image of Jesus and deeply loved by Him. 
As God opens our eyes to his love, to the needs around us, he, open, he also opens our eyes to how we can step into this work. It may be daunting. It's daunting for me. And you're here in America, which in ways is more difficult because people don't want to hear here. People don't want to hear about the love of God here. But even if it's terrifying, what a privilege. What a privilege to take the love and the power and the presence of Jesus to a hurting world. And what joy to see how he's able to take our stumbling efforts and do more through us than we could ever imagine. I'm going to close again with Mark's challenge, which I just find so inspiring. Open our eyes to the reality of God and God's kingdom. Know that you are in a long line of believers who have trusted in the good news. Put your trust in Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Don't just believe talking the talk, but walk in the way of Jesus Christ. The cost is your very life. Thank you.
think that's it. Okay. Um, prayers. Prayers to the people. Oh, we have an announcement or prayer or a praise or something. Um, yesterday, we served 65 people breakfast. And 25 boxes went out to feed 54 people. So all told, we served 30 different households yesterday. So our food baskets are going quite well. Any prayer requests? We do. Uh, the Jerry. Place. 
Show us how to proclaim your kingdom. Holy Trinity God, have mercy on us. We pray for the world. Bring peace and restoration to all in need. Deliver us from malice and temptation. Set free, set us free to share your spirit's gifts, and especially in Bangladesh for the Basha program that uh, you will move in these women's lives. Holy Triune God, have mercy on us. We pray for this community. Open the doors of this congregation. Let strangers feel welcome here and make us ready to meet Christ with them. Holy Triune God, have mercy on us. We pray for our loved ones. We know the struggle and concern of many. Take away their fear, pain, doubt, fear. For you are a God who works wonders. For Benjamin, for Charlie, for Chuck and Sylvia, for um, the girl with the broken elbow. Holy Triune God, have mercy on us. As we ask for your freedom, ask of you, Lord, Holy God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And it is not the temptation that deliver us to eat, the divine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus invites us to follow him in all ways, including the use and sharing of our resources an accounting of our time, talent, and treasure that reflects our active citizenship in the kingdom brings glory to the Holy One. These seeds bear fruit. Now stand for the doxology.
glorify God and bear fruit. Amen.